Throughout the warm waters of the Atlantic, from Brazil to Bermuda, once every year, men in small boats search the shallows in quest of a special prize. Panaliris argus, the spiny lobster, named for the hundred-eyed monster of Greek mythology, considered a gourmet delicacy throughout the world. Normally, spiny lobsters are scattered over large areas and are not easily found, but it was recently discovered that once a year, in large numbers, they mysteriously assemble. For scientists, this gathering is a puzzling phenomenon. For fishermen, it is a windfall. But for the lobsters, it is a tragedy. The lobsters, mysteriously commanded to march by the first winter storm, will form long columns and begin an extraordinary procession. Drawn by the riddle of their strange behavior, Captain Cousteau and the Calypso divers will follow the spiny lobsters on an incredible journey across the ocean floor. In Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, Lewis Carroll wrote of a lobster quadrille. Will you come and join the dance? Will you, won't you? Will you, won't you? Will you join the dance? Yet neither he nor Alice nor anyone had ever seen the incredible lobster march. Calypso arrives at Contoy, a small Caribbean island off Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, where, once every winter, spiny lobsters gather. Gathering also are fishermen, come to reap their annual lobster harvest. Lobster fishermen are active throughout the year. Local divers, followed by a Calypso team, seek out resident lobsters scattered in the Yucatan Channel. Equipped only with a mask, a long-handled hook, and a glove to protect them against the lobster's carapace, these fishermen often descend as deep as 90 feet. The use of air tanks when capturing lobsters is forbidden by Mexican law. Hunters' raids into the lobsters' homes cause panic. <laughs> 
Divers sometimes remain below for more than two minutes at a time, often in vain. After repeated dives, an exhausting day's work may yield as few as five or six lobsters. <laughs> Since winter storms may force Calypso to seek shelter farther south, the divers depart to set up a base camp on Contoy, where they will maintain a continuous watch for the lobster march. The island is small, about four miles long. The Mexican government has declared Contoy a wildlife sanctuary. Its lush vegetation provides a variety of seabirds with breeding and nesting sites. During lobster season, it is used by fishermen when they prepare their catch for the marketplace. Piled high are the bleached remnants of past lobster holocausts. At Contoy, only the tails are taken. The rest of the lobster is wastefully discarded. I embark on an aerial reconnaissance. Once the migration begins, the lobsters march, single file, past the northern tip of the island and on toward deeper water. Prior to the march, they will assemble in small groups all along Yucatan's northern shores. The lagoons and mangrove swamps of Contoy are habitats for a wide variety of marine creatures not found in open waters. While they wait for the lobster migration to begin, the divers have an opportunity to examine these warm, murky lagoons. These waterways are seldom explored. The brown pelicans that inhabit this sanctuary are unaccustomed to visitors. At the edge of the lagoon, an area heavy with underwater growth is chosen for the first dive. Mangrove forests along tropical saltwater estuaries produce root systems that conceal exotic underwater animals. The dusty scenery is an entanglement of rotting roots and gelatinous scrolls, decaying algae that disintegrate at touch. The turbid space is filled with a mixture of hatching and expiring creatures. Cassiopeia, a sort of jellyfish, Lying upside down in their feeding position, they litter the floor of the lagoon. They are mostly sedentary creatures, which carry with them their own gardens of algae. They expose their undersides to the light. Photosynthesis will ensure their garden's growth. The pulsations create a steady current of water to bring nutrients to the flourishing algae.
the Cassiopeia settles back to the bottom, still in its feeding position. Like an armored tank, a horseshoe crab scurries along, propelled by its ten hidden legs. It crashes through the field of Cassiopeia. Apparently, its widely placed eyes are useless in avoiding obstacles directly in its path. Horseshoe crabs are not true crabs at all. Although they are arthropods, they are not crustaceans and are closely related to scorpions and spiders. They have existed essentially unchanged for more than 300 million years. We observe a male and a female in close association. The male, smaller than the female, is equipped with long hooks with which he can cling to the rear of the female's shell for days or even weeks at a time. The male's hold is surprisingly tenacious. Ultimately, the female will pull this free rider onto the beach where she will deposit her eggs. He will then fertilize them and finally disengage himself. It is an arrangement that has sustained this species for millennia. Aboard Calypso, daily dives are made to detect signs of the lobster gathering. It was discovered in recent years that all along the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula, spiny lobsters begin to group prior to the first northern storm of winter and immediately afterwards begin their mysterious migratory march. Cousteau and the divers will search the bottom of the Yucatan Channel, a vast plain dotted with rocks used as hiding places by the lobsters. Crowded together under a ledge, in a place where normally one or two lobsters might be found hiding, are more than 20. They have moved in during the night and adopted this protected space. And here they will likely remain until they all somehow sense it is time to march. How the lobsters are able to anticipate weather conditions is a mystery. But every year when they arrive and huddle tightly together in their sanctuaries, one may expect a storm. Brandishing its long, thorny antennae, a single courageous lobster emerges in an apparent attempt to drive us away. The spiny lobster is, in fact, a crayfish and has no claws with which to discourage predators. It pushes with its whip-like antennae to keep a distance between itself and what it perceives as danger. Its muscular tail uncoils quickly to give the lobster sudden, short bursts of speed. This is our first confrontation with these strangely audacious creatures. In the past, we had thought them characterless as large insects. But now, as we observe them close up, we discover them to be highly fascinating and complicated animals. They inspire in us an intense desire to know them better 
as they assemble for their annual march. As Cousteau waits for the march of the spiny lobsters to begin, the expedition at Isla Contoy is joined by William Hernkind of Florida State University. Dr. Hernkind is a leading authority on spiny lobsters and was the first marine biologist to study their migratory behavior, primarily in the Bahamas, less than a decade ago. This is his first visit to Contoy. You know, we've seen many lobsters in our life. We've never seen any migrating. I think it's special to this species, the spiny lobster, or is it um, general uh, behavior? Well, at the present time, the only documented migrations of this type with the animals lining up in formations and so forth is uh, for this species, Pangularis argus. But there's some evidence from, uh, from South Africa and also from New Zealand yeah. that species there may also mass up and move. Vous, bébé, on vous avez jamais vu des langoustes euh, émigrer en Méditerranée J'ai vu par enfant des langoustes qui se promenaient, mais par une ou deux ou trois, je n'ai jamais vu un Jamais en ligne Jamais en ligne. Jamais. So, in Mediterranean, you've never met, never came across anything like that. How do they, how is it, you show me a photo, and uh, je voudrais vous montrer ça. Show me these two photos, which are quite interesting. <coughs> These uh, were taken at different times, but obviously both during migrations. This was uh, in 1969. You notice that uh, they're lined up. Uh, a friend of mine suggested that we, we call this lining up a Q, Q-U-E-U-E, -U -E, yeah. yeah. the British word. And, uh, it's a French word, too. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> like, he didn't know that, I didn't. <clears throat> and uh, you notice they, uh, just as it suggests, it's a line. Each uh, individual is in contact with the animal ahead, and they maintain physical contact with the antennual and with the anterior walking legs so that uh, they maintain their integrity all the time while they're walking in the queue and at night when it's very dark they have no need of seeing one another once they have formed the queue now this uh, migration starts at a given moment in the year where the lobsters are not uh, bearing eggs right the uh, main spawning season for them is in the spring so that's uh, beyond April, the, yeah. right so this is at the tail end the absolute tail end of the breeding season and we have never found amongst migrants we've never found any with with eggs on them i'm not sure that they don't migrate without the yeah. storm though uh, we see uh, in our area that in about mid-october before there has been any heavy weather to speak of the, uh, there, is a, there are very strong signs of movement, areas which had no lobsters that were just open sand areas with a few rock ledges with a few dozen animals, all of a sudden are, are packed with, uh, with hundreds. And they've moved in at night, and they will move the next night. And this is all before any storm has taken place. And uh, once the storm comes, sufficient magnitude, then we see them moving by day out over the open areas. I think at that time there's so many animals present that there's just not enough cover for them, so they have no place to stop, and so they just keep on moving rather than resting at night. And if we see signs of that, it would suggest that a similar kind of uh, uh, phenomenon is occurring here. It may not. They may, uh, they may just all move only when there's a very severe uh, storm which, which uh, stirs up the bottom or has some physical effect. Now the fishermen begin to place nets across the channel to be ready for the migration when it occurs. The nets now are heavy mostly with seaweed and debris. The lobster catch is still sparse. Late in the day, the skies are cloudy, and the first storm of the season seems imminent. When Albert Falco, Bernard Delamotte, his younger brother Patrick, and cameraman Michel Delois depart from the base camp at Contoy. Dr. Hernkind had warned that the lobsters could possibly begin to migrate before the storm. To make sure that they do not miss the march, the team dives every night to check the fishermen's nets. Yeah. 
After feeding all day in open water, the winged residents of the Contoy Sanctuary are returning to their nesting sites. Thousands of cormorants and pelicans pepper the sky and sea. A fisherman's net, hidden beneath the water's surface, has become a hazard for birds feeding in these waters. Cormorants, helplessly trapped in a web meant for others. The more they struggle, the more entangled they become. The divers will do what they can to liberate those that are still able to fly. Once more after nightfall, the divers descend to see if there are lobsters trapped in the net. Rather than lobsters at the bottom of the net, we find an army of crabs. Attracted by ensnared fish, the crabs themselves have become entangled. They rip and tear the net. We find a single imprisoned lobster fighting for its freedom as tiny anchovies dash about in the growing swell. Strenuously, it works its way backwards toward the edge of the net. It is free. The spiny lobster uses its legs to scoop up its prey, then draws it to its mouth, which is located on the underside of its head. It usually feeds on small, slow-moving crustaceans and mollusks. These darting anchovies are difficult for the lobster to catch. At daybreak, a northern gale begins to build in force. The first December storm has begun. The fishermen have retreated to the protection of land, their small boats no match for the swelling sea. Diving too must be halted. The men of the Calypso team on Contoy are forced to seek shelter in their tents. They anxiously await the clearing that will allow them to observe the phenomenon of the lobster march. For two days, the Calypso team has waited for the storm at Contoy to subside. The rain has finally let up, but the gale winds continue to blow. Divers are unwilling to wait any longer. Anxious to discover if the lobster march has begun, they head north from the protected waters of the cove out into the still turbulent sea.
how lobsters react to a storm has never been observed. The turbulence has stirred up the fine calcareous sand, mixing it with debris of algae uprooted by the swell. Visibility is poor. Then revealed is a large group of spiny lobsters huddled beneath a ledge. The march has not yet begun. Some lobsters have moved out of their dens. They begin to walk across open terrain but they are loosely organized, not yet lined up in a queue. They look formidable as they lash out with their whip-like antennae, but in fact, when they are exposed during the day, they are vulnerable to predators. Triggerfish. The lobsters are surrounded and they disperse, waving their antennae to fend off the attackers. The nets of fishermen are not the only threat to spiny lobsters. Trigger fish, there is fierce competition. Once their sharp teeth penetrate the shell, the lobster is doomed. As the triggerfish devour the last of their prey, the sea seems calmer, the storm near its end. In the late afternoon, with the change in the weather, Cousteau and Dr. Hernkind arrive from Calypso to join the team at the base camp on Contoy Island. The fishermen are now back in their boats, ready to reap their harvest from the migration, which, with nightfall, should be imminent. The storm has left, but its chill remains. The campfire will provide a comfortable setting for a discussion between the explorer and his consultant. Now, today, today particularly, we had the northwest gale, the current uh, just changed uh, this afternoon. The water is clearing up. The wind veered to the east. Apparently, all the conditions are there for uh, the migration tonight. And all the, the fishermen are very excited. They are putting their nets. They are ready for the big fishing. So I hope that this happens tonight. They yeah. say if it doesn't happen tonight, then we have to wait for another north These lobstermen uh, have done this for years, and I would at this point in time, bet that they're, they're correct. They're probably right. I, I would think we would be a little more patient than they are and uh, wait an extra day, <laughs> perhaps, if they don't show up tonight. I think I will organize a night watch under, under water. I think it'd be worthwhile. Because Teams uh, diving one after another to make sure that the lobsters don't escape our vigil. <laughs> the night patrol is underway. Among the divers, there is a growing sense of expectancy. The cold night air seems to promise an invitation to a march.
the lobsters we find are no longer crowded together, hidden inside their lairs. Instead, they have emerged to group around coral and sponges, which seem to give them a sense of security. They face outward, their antennae waving, touching one another. At no other time have we observed lobsters in such numbers in the open, away from protective cover. Then a small group begins to move out, as if in response to a mysterious signal. When the diver approaches, one of the group tries to push him away. Then, without losing a step, they move on. Our first view of the queuing formation. Maintaining body contact in perfect synchronization, they march in a single line. They are among the vanguard, to be followed by thousands more. That the march has begun is soon reflected above by the catch in the fishermen's boats. Lobster columns rapidly become longer and longer as small groups are stimulated to combine with others. Platoons of marching lobsters soon grow into armies, traveling at a speed of more than half a mile an hour. A straight line formation seems to break up. Disturbed by the proximity of the diver and his lights, the lobsters scramble. They begin to form a circle with their antennae pointed upward and outward. It is a defensive maneuver, a response to threat, reminiscent of a wagon train resisting attack in the Old West. When the group seems reassured that there is no danger, the lobsters begin to string out again to continue their march. This organized migration is unique among bottom-dwelling crustaceans, and its destination remains subject to speculation. Tagging the lobsters has provided no clue. They molt several times a year and shed their tagged shells. Day and night in the waters off Contoy, Cousteau and the Calypso team will follow and try to fathom this strange trek of the spiny lobsters. A school of grunts circles the skeleton of a submerged truck. It has attracted other visitors as well. 
Once spiny lobsters begin their march, they take advantage of shelters along the way to rest, particularly during the day. Those positioned on the outside seem like sentries, guarding the group against intruders. Lobsters react to the Calypso intruders. They resume their march, assembling now in a line. They maintain physical contact with their front legs and their sensors, the slender Y-shaped antennules located between their antennae. The rear guard turns as if checking to see who is following, and the march is underway. In single file, they travel in lines varying from three or four to nearly 200 lobsters. This exodus, what motivates it? Are the lobsters seeking more abundant feeding grounds? Are new areas appropriate for spawning, as has been speculated? It is doubtful, for spawning will not take place for six months. In either case, why should they run so fast? The leader is the trailblazer. It works the hardest, and when it ties, it drops back to be replaced by the next in line, so that the pace of the march is maintained. Like creatures from another time and place, they gallop across the sand, racing over a range known to be at least 50 miles and probably much more. In only three or four days, more than 700,000 of these marching lobsters were caught the previous year. These fishermen's nets are heavy now. There will be no local buyers for so many lobsters captured in so short a time. The tails only, deep frozen, will be sent to distant marketplaces. The rest is wastefully discarded, an economic paradox. Lobsters that escape the nets continue their march. Like living chains, they snake their way across the bottom of the sea. Bernard Delamotte approaches a column to see how they react to his presence. He hovers above them and then slowly descends. The response is immediate. Sheaves of antennae insist he keep his distance. The column resumes its march, but maintains its guard. They maneuver past the diver like a line of infantrymen, bayonets drawn. The 
more Bernard persists, the more aggressive the lobsters become. He cannot impede the march, which is propelled by an irresistible force. According to a hypothesis of Dr. Hernkind, the answer to the riddle of the spiny lobster's march may possibly be found in its evolutionary past. During the last ice age, more than 10,000 years ago, the spiny lobster was triggered by the first northern storm of winter to migrate from quickly cooling shallows to warmer waters. Today, although the tropical shallows remain warm during the winter, the migration persists. Can it be that this march is a consequence of confused ancestral memories? A dropout fallen behind is looked after by the rear guard. The straggler in front is pushed and prodded back toward the line of marchers. Good eyesight and the ability to receive directional information from the movement of waves and currents help guide migrating lobsters on their way. By now, the line is far ahead. To catch up, they march on the double, seemingly driven to join the others. The distance between the line and the trailing twosome is narrowing now. During the migration season, no lobster travels alone. They are compelled to be part of a group. One of the most organized migrations in all the sea is that of the spiny lobster. The leader can be male or female, old or young. Apparently, it is the most active, the most eager migrator that the others automatically follow. The last in line functions as a rear guard. It drops off to confront Bernard. It is like a valiant soldier assigned to service as a diversionary decoy, jeopardizing its own safety to protect the others. Bernard tests the lobster's behavior in the face of threat. It backs off, but with snaps of its tail displays aggression. Amazingly, it stands its ground, using its tail to raise a cloud of dust in a futile attempt to ward off the threat. With a single stroke of its tail, it could easily flee. During migration, a single lobster like this will engage a predator and probably be devoured, as it gives the rest of the line time to move off to a safe distance. Night and day, head to tail, in lockstep, the spiny lobsters march. With time out for rest, they average seven miles a day and travel, it is supposed, for nearly a week. Yet, where they are going, or where they have come from, nobody knows. 
In the wake of their caravans, their basic mysteries remain. If their marching behavior is a living echo of the last glacial period thousands of years ago, then they may well be prepared for what is yet to come, another ice age. Could it be that the spiny lobsters are marching not only to the tick of their own life cycle, but to the pulse of the earth as well? The riddle of the spiny lobster remains. At Contoy, the lobster parade has passed. To the fishermen, the spoils of the incredible bonanza. <laughs> Discarded lobster heads remain as brittle monuments to man's wastefulness. Impressive evidence of the heavy fishing toll. The fact that all these fishermen here, 32 boats with their little boats, are uh, picking up all the lobsters they can during that migration, uh, do you think it is of the nature of endangering the species? Well, the lobsters are so easy to catch at this time, here and every place else that it's fished, that uh, if it's a uh, important part, very important part of the life history of the animal, it probably is. Uh, this kind of exploitation could seriously endanger the species. There's no way of telling here or anywhere else that I know of whether it is or not yet. Because, um, I don't know, I have a, a, an impression that uh, they are catching only a very small part of the migration. Or if the lobsters have started to migrate during the stormy period when they do not fish, then it's quite likely that a large portion of the lobsters actually escapes. And furthermore, uh, who knows, they may be migrating to the outside of the island here and elsewhere as well, but the fishermen are not able to fish because it's too deep, too many rocks, there's too much surf. The mass slaughter of the lobsters during their migration is a fairly recent activity. The numbers caught have not yet grown smaller, but the size of each individual has decreased. In spite of the yearly havoc, let us hope that for ages to come, lobsters will feed and spawn in the shallows, and then, beckoned by the first call of each winter, gather and engage in the ritual of their incredible march. <laughs>